and perspectives related to general relativity. Jurek, the floor is yours. Thank you very much. So a few months ago, I had a talk during the doctoral seminar, and I tried to discuss the relation between mathematics and physics. Of course, it is very complex, but roughly speaking, if we divide what we are doing into mathematics and physics, or rather physics and mathematics in the following way, that physics is when we write down equations, whereas mathematics, when we try to solve them, this is very naive, but this is just the first approximation. <coughs> so this talk... <laughs> so, but according to this uh, classification, this will be uh, the talk in physics. Although, of course, I will use some mathematical uh, structures, but <coughs> I will try to uh, understand the very origin of general relativity theory, and at the very end, if I have enough time, I will try to propose some improvement, because everything we know about gravity comes from observation of the solar system, which means from the observation of very, very weak uh, gravitational fields, and in this <coughs> regime, uh, general relativity uh, works perfectly. But nowadays, people desperately look for generalizations of general relativity uh, because of this dark matter problem, exotic, and so on and so on. However, extrapolation from the solar system to cosmology is uh, this is extrapolation by 20 orders of magnitude and we know that it never happened in the history of humanity that such an extrapolation works we on the other hand of the macroscopic scale which we understand roughly speaking namely uh, not going towards bigger and bigger, but going towards smaller and smaller, we know that already extrapolation of the classical physics by eight orders of magnitude is a nonsense. It does not work. We uh, teach children that uh, the atom cannot be described <coughs> with the tools which perfectly work in the in the region of, uh, say, uh, things which are one centimeter, around one cent of the order of, of one centimeter. But in cosmology, people try to extrapolate a theory by 20 orders of magnitude, and uh, uh, in this talk, I, I will try to start from the very beginning. By the way, we know that the Einstein's ideas about curvature and so on and so on were clarified by his discussion with David Hilbert, and David Hilbert had an idea to derive the theory from such a variational principle, then in the 20s, Einstein, <coughs> he was very much attached to the old idea that the universe is, uh, does not change, that uh, uh, it is constant. Therefore, he was obliged to add the cosmological constant in order to justify his stationary model of the universe. Later on, he uh, considered this uh, cosmological constant as, as the uh, worst or biggest error of his life, and he blamed it. However, nowadays we see that it was not such a bad idea, 
without cosmological constant, it is even worse. So we accept cosmo uh, uh, later on uh, further improvements or generalizations were proposed and discussed. For example, the, uh, a proposal to add the quadratic term in the uh, scalar curvature. Uh, this proposal is due to Andrei Sakharov. Uh, he did it in uh, 1966 or something like that. Andrei, so this uh, Sakharov improvement was the origin was the idea to quantize whatever it means to quantize the gravitational field and it seemed to Sakharov that such a term will help in the renormalization. Uh, nowadays a lot there is a school of people a lot of people who are looking for such theories where f is an arbitrary function of the curvature for instance such one uh, and people uh, try to uh, to fit the the properties of this function to observed um, cosmological or, or astrophysical phenomena. There, are, there is also a school of people who uh, admit even more general dependence of the Lagrangian, namely dependence upon the entire uh, curvature tensor. Many years ago, I was able to prove that all such theories are equivalent to the uh, conventional uh, general relativity interacting maybe with some extra matter field. Therefore, the uh, lesson from this result, this is a mathematical result technical, I would say, that whenever, instead of looking for new Lagrangians, it is equivalent to look for new matter fields. But nevertheless, this result doesn't help us to invent the correct matter field to describe this uh, cosmological phenomena. Okay, so let us uh, go back by 110 years, for instance, to 1910, when Einstein had already this idea that the uh, gravitation has something to do with, the, uh, with geometry. Okay, so if no gravity and no other force, then the Newton's first law uh, is valid, which means there is an inertial reference frame. <clears throat> and I want to spend some time in trying to understand what would be this notion of the inertial frame. The first approximation is the inertial frame is just a um, coordinate system coordinate system such that the free motion is described by such an equation, second derivative, because if you say uh, rectilinear uh, uh, motion, uh, it means roughly speaking that. Okay, so Newton's first law tells us that there are coordinates in which this is roughly speaking equation for freely uh, moving <coughs> bodies. Uh, however, we are not in 1905, uh, but already in 1910, and therefore we already know special re uh, special relativity, which is roughly speaking, special relativity is electrodynamics, roughly speaking. We know already that space and time are not two different uh, geometrical object, but 
they belong to the bigger object, namely, there are two aspects of space-time. Therefore, from the very beginning, those y alpha are not space coordinates, but space-time coordinates. And of course, you may ask me, dot is always time derivative, but where is time? So, suppose we are in a spaceship, this is a trajectory, we are trying to describe the trajectory of a spaceship far away from, from here. There is no obvious reference system, and the time derivative is the derivative to some internal time. For instance, my biological time. I feel very well my bio biological time, or some time on, on my watch. Okay. Uh, in uh, Newton's time, uh, people were con uh, convinced that the universe is small. Were you? Later on, they had to extend the scale, extend at the very beginning, they were convinced that the, uh, the moon is something like maybe 10 times farther than the Mount Everest or something like that, and those scales were small. Therefore, they were, uh, everything was global, roughly speaking, because if something is small, it means that uh, the um, local description is uh, also valid for the entire space. Now, let me, uh, very often we are forced to use non-inertial frame, just any. Take any coordinate system, which maybe is not inertial, like those y, and rewrite the same equation in this non-inertial frame. So what we do, well, we simply differentiate. I will not go beyond uh, mathematics of the first and second year of the studies. Once more, differentiate. So this is an, um, so we have two terms. First, we differentiate axis, and then we have to differentiate this object. So again, we differentiate over axis times x with respect to time. Now, this matrix is invertible because uh, both y's and x's are uh, coordinate systems. Therefore, we assume that uh, we may pass from one to another and vice versa. Therefore, this uh, matrix is inverted. But, ah, excuse me. I have uh, I inherited, probably with the milk of my mother, the so-called um, Einstein uh, summation convention. I always forget to tell it. Einstein, Einstein had invented many extremely important things, but the Einstein's summation convention, uh, convention is equally great, equally <laughs> important, because it helped us to write down formulae in a much compacter way. Therefore, whenever there is an index, for instance, nu, which runs from one to four, or if you wish, from zero to three, Whenever such an index is repeated twice, while once up and once down, it means that the summation over all possible values here is... Uh, therefore, for instance, here, there is a double sum over four possible values of nu and over four possible values of mu. Okay. Therefore, uh, but if this matrix, four by four matrix, is invertible, then we may uh, uh, multiply both sides by the inverse matrix, and the inverse is, of course, the, again, the, uh, those. And this way, we obtain the, uh, the same equation, but written in non-inertial uh, system of... Uh, 
This means that the acceleration vanishes. Acceleration vanishes means that the second derivative vanishes only in the inertial frame. Otherwise, no. Yeah. Now, uh, co coordinate uh, these new coordinates are also inertial, if and only if the uh, the second derivatives of one. The, of those y's with respect to x's is zero because then it vanishes and again x. This observation leads to the following mathematical construction. So this is already mathematics, what I want to tell you, but first year of, uh, of uh, analysis at the university mathematics, very simple, namely, there is an um, equivalence relation between different different um, coordinate systems. Namely, two coordinate systems are equivalent from this from for our purposes if and if only if second derivatives of y with respect to x are equal to zero. Of course. It doesn't look like a uh, equivalent relation between uh, because equivalence relation must be symmetric. And here, of course, the role of y's and x's is different. But it is very easy exercise in differential calculus to prove that if this is true, that also vice versa, second derivative of x's with respect to y's. So indeed, it is a uh, legal equivalence relation. Therefore, inertia, now I know what is inertial frame, because inertial frame is not a coordinate system. Because if I took take any other which is equivalent, it is equally good for our for these purposes. So inertial frame is not a coordinate system, but it is an uh, equivalence class of co coordinate system. Nowadays, global, global, global. If there is no gravity, we, we are at the beginning of uh, 17th century in Newton's time, it could be the, the Newtonian physics can be explained this way. Of um, course. Sorry, Professor, can I ask a question? Uh, yeah. Uh, like a technical question just about this first line. Uh, just you, you said that the second coordinate system would be inertial if this Hessian matrix, if and only if this Hessian matrix would vanish. But sort of formally, at least, okay, just looking now on this equation, it's not clear for me because you have also implicit summation over alpha and like I don't know whether this case uh, I know it's like a, some binary form kind of contracted with I mean su summed over alpha right uh, but I guess it's like I just wanted to make sure if it's just uh, if I can figure out the details uh, here yeah So, does it make sense what I'm asking? So I guess you require that the second derivative of x just vanishes. It's much more involved. It contains summation over alpha. That, uh, of course, it contains summation over alpha. Yeah, but of course, because this is an invertible matrix. Therefore, if this vanishes for uh, for every lambda, then of course this vanishes for every alpha because this matrix is invertible. If something vanishes when multiplied by the invertible matrix, then it sure, must okay, I understand. Uh, okay, thank you. Thanks. Okay. Okay. Of course, you may say that I complicate too much the things because this uh, high bro notation does not mean anything more that one coordinates are linear functions of the other. Of course, yes, I agree. At this, at, the, at that point, uh, it was not necessary to in, in, introduce this very highbrow uh, notion. But 
uh, it is a good les lesson. <clears throat> By the way, this combination of second and first and second uh, derivatives were from the very beginning y are inertial coordinates and x are uh, our coordinates in uh, which we use to perform our calculations it is useful to call uh, with one letter these are gammas and therefore motion in our inertial frame may be written this way if you wish we may multiply both sides by the mass and we may call this inertial forces and this is precisely what we teach children on the second or third year these are the, all those Coriolis, centrifugal and etc etc forces written in such a way Till now there was no gravitation. Now what is gravitation? I propose to think about gravitation uh, in the following way. We must replace the Newton's first law by what I like to call Einstein's first law and the difference is only that there are no global structures and Newton was right but only locally because the universe is not so small that everything which we observe locally is valid globally. No, no, no. Universe is big. Therefore, I propose the following, how to say, formulation of Einstein's ideas, because these were the original Einstein uh, ideas which uh, he was fighting with uh, by first uh, five years of general relativity, namely between 1910 and 1915, uh, when he, he finally uh, had uh, this discussion uh, with uh, Hilbert. Okay, so Einstein's first law. There is an inertial frame, but non global, but only locally at each space time point separately. Maybe there is no global, and we know that there is no global. Uh, let me discuss a bit more this proposal. What does it mean? This means that whenever you, we choose a point in space-time, any M is space-time, then there are local coordinates, again I call them Y alpha, in a neighborhood of this M, such that freely falling bodies fulfill the same equation as previously, but only at this point, because already leaving this point, it ma the right hand side may be non zero. But so, the, my, uh, the Einstein's first law tells us that at every, uh, at each um, space-time point, there are inertial coordinates, which, roughly speaking, uh, Pavel Nurovsky, who very much understands the structures of uh, differential equations, he would say, probably say, what you, what you say, it means that the equations of motion are of the second differential order. Yes, indeed, it is nothing more, nothing less. However, let me stick to this formulation. And again, if I want to rewrite this equation in another, because very often even Newton was uh, obliged to use non-inertial, non-curvilinear <laughs> coordinates to prove uh, the, uh, to show how the tra to describe the trajectories of the planet. So very often we are using non-inertial coordinates. This is very seldom that we are able to prove something using inertial coordinates. So the, uh, we may perform, uh, do the same calculations and we obtain the same 
Huh? So again, if and only if this uh, second uh, co derivatives of one uh, coordinate with respect to the others is equal zero, then x x lambda is also an inertial frame, which means that the following <sighs> mathematical construction is uh, very natural that again we say that two uh, coordinate systems are equivalent but equivalent at a point m because previously we discussed global uh, coordinates and global uh, equivalence whereas this equivalence is completely different if we change the point. Okay, so they are equivalent if and only if the second derivatives vanish, but only at this particular point. And again, I would say that local inertial frame is just an equivalence class. <coughs> and for those of you who uh, know a little bit of uh, differential geometry, I would say that the collection of all local reference frames uh, has a structure of a fiber bundle over space-time. And, uh, okay, so given a coordinate system, any reference frame, which means system of coordinates, and this sign means that we take the uh, class of uh, coordinate system which is equivalent to that one. So, so any class can be uniquely parameterized by the following table of numbers. In if the if space time if is four dimensional, then this means that given a coordinate system, any local reference frames is described by 40 numbers, such a table of numbers, and there are 40 numbers. Why 40? Because this is by definition symmetric, because this is given by the second derivatives which are symmetric, and uh, th th there are uh, 10 uh, 4 by 4 symmetric matrices. 10. However, there is again this third uh, index, lambda, which may assume four independent values, which means that roughly speaking, the, in such a table there are 40 independent informations. So, to pick up a, a reference frame is equivalent to give 40 numbers. How, for this pair, this is just a very important uh, <coughs> fact about this, because I would like to uh, assign uh, these coordinates not just to uh, coordinate system Y, but to the entire um, equivalence class. And it is very easy to prove, to show, this is just a, a three lines calculus, that in fact, if I replace Y, but coordinates which are equivalent to wise this way, the value will be the same. This is very, very easy. So indeed, this gamma uh, represents not just a system Y, but a coordinate, uh, but the entire class. Okay. So, we, at each uh, space-time point, we have a whole bunch, 40-dimensional bunch of, uh, of 
um, inertial frames. And now Einstein's version of the first law tells that between all those 40 dimensional uh, collection of all possible reference phrases, uh, frames at this point, there is one which has been chosen by either God or nature or what, whoever you wish, which is called inertial. So, mathematic, uh, mathematically, it is a section of the frame bundle uh, or a symmetric connection. So, this means that I would call gravitational field just a field of inertial frame. Whenever uh, somebody has chosen at each space-time uh, point a specific inertial frame and uh, as an inertial frame, then it is a gravitational field. Field of inertial frame. So the, uh, the, uh, the answer for the question which I formulated in the title, what is gravi gravitation? A field of inertial frame. Uh, in particular, if gamma at a certain, so uh, we uh, work in, uh, in, uh, refer in the coordinate system wise, if by, just by chance gamma vanishes, then this means that just at this point our coordinates are inertial and so on. This is the gravitational force, if you wish. Uh, and this is roughly speaking a certain um, formulation of the Einstein's idea uh, about free-falling elevator of spaceship and so on and so on. Typically inertial coordinates at the point are not inertial at neighboring point unless space-time is flat in a neighborhood. And now I would like to spend just a few minutes giving you, presenting you a theory of a curvature. Because if somebody gives me a very complicated uh, 40, 40 uh, functions and claims that this is uh, the description of our space-time, I would like first of all to check whether that may be, even if it is complicated. Is it complicated due to the fact that this space-time is very curved, on, or, is it, or the space-time is flat, but he used a very complicated system of equations, of uh, coordinates? So, I would like to have a criterion which enables me uh, to discriminate between the situation where gamma is complicated not because the geometry is complicated but because we use complicated system coordinates oh and this is a theory of uh, connect uh, of curvature and this is a different theory so let me um, I, I like very much the theory of, con of curvature formulated this way, so I hope that you will <laughs> not escape from... <laughs> uh, so, first of all, if gamma is not zero, which means that my coordinates are not inertial at a certain point, it is very easy to improve them. Namely, to, uh, for instance, uh, to add a second order, to add a second order correction. Uh, if uh, uh, those m's are coordinates of the point where we are uh, discussing our situation, if x is not inertial, the non-inertiality is measured by those table of 40 numbers, so if I add such a second order correction to the gamma, then this new system of correction becomes uh, inertial, which means it is a very easy thing, 
uh, uh, to simplify notation, I will use uh, centered coordinates, such coordinates that uh, the point in which we are uh, discussing uh, has coordinate zero. Of course, this means that I only shift coordinate, add, I add something constant, and of course, the shifting of coordinate has uh, no influence on gamma because gamma is defined by the derivatives of the coordinate. Therefore, if I add a constant number, it doesn't change nothing. Okay, so in uh, uh, centered coordinates, this recipe, how to improve non-inertial coordinates looks like that. So this is a nice interpretation of gamma. What is gamma? It is a necessary, it is a correction, the second order correction, which is necessary to upgrade our non-inertial coordinates to the level of inertial. I think it is very nice interpretation of gamma. So we see that gamma may be killed at each point separately. Now we would, uh, uh, I suspect that uh, maybe space time is flat, which means that maybe I am able to kill gamma also in a neighborhood. How to check it? Ha! It is not an easy task, but as a physicist, we are pragmatic, and instead of trying to kill already gamma in a neighborhood, try to kill the derivatives of gamma. So we know that gamma at a point may already be killed by an appropriate coordinate transformation. And now are we able to kill also derivative. Here I use such a uh, notation. This notation is due to uh, Paul Eresman, a great Belgian uh, geometer who invented the so-called jets, theory of jets. So whenever I add an extra um, index, this means that I consider <coughs> derivatives. Just partial derivatives. Okay, so now let me see uh, whether I can kill derivatives of gamma by an appropriate uh, correction of derivatives. So I, we already know that the zero order corrections does not change anything. Now, also first-order corrections are irrelevant. What are first-order corrections? It means that I could apply here, multiply this by uh, a constant um, matrix. Of course, it must be inverted. But this constant matrix enters here, and here enters an inverse matrix, therefore we see that it will cancel. Therefore, it is easy to see that the first order corrections are irrelevant. They will not uh, change gamma and so on. Okay, now, second order corrections is already fixed because we have, uh, we want to kill gamma at this point. So, what uh, remains are four, third and fourth order corrections. Now, fourth order and higher order corrections are irrelevant at this point, because if I take for, fourth order correction, here I differentiate twice, now I differentiate third time, after three differentiations from the uh, fourth order correction, there remains still one x which vanishes at m therefore you see that higher order corrections do not change anything at this particular point so what remains are only third order corrections and it is very, so if i use this third order correction it is very easy to see that 
the new gammas. Okay, so I use the second order correction, which till my gamma, and I use third order corrections, which give such an improvement in the deriv derivative of gamma. There are a priori, you could see, ah, that's it. I may kill it because I will choose y in such a way that it kills the derivative, but it is not true. Why? Because w, roughly speaking, is totally symmetric. If it is not, then in this expression, only totally symmetric part enters into account. You see, because these are, co uh, co um, these are coefficients and the third order polynomial. And these coefficients must, must be symmetric, only symmetric part enters. So from the very beginning, I can assume that W is totally symmetric in, in, in this. Whereas gamma is, of course, symmetric, as I told you, in those first indices, but of course, no other symmetry can be assumed, which means that I am able to kill only the symmetric part. And what remains, it will remain forever, which simply means that if this uh, the matrix of the derivatives of gamma is not totally symmetric, there I will not be able to kill the, uh, even the, the first derivatives, which means that the space is not flat. And this is very nice criterion, and I may call this quantity a curvature tensor. Of course, this definition is the uh, Let me repeat the definition of the curvature tensor, which I formulate here. First, pass to inertial system. And then in inertial system, subtract from the uh, table of derivatives of gamma, subtract its totally symmetric part. What remains, treat as a... Uh, um, components of, of a tensor. And this is a good definition. But of course, we, are, we would like to be able to uh, perform this calculus in any uh, coordinate system, not necessary, necessarily uh, inertial. And it is, it is uh, easy to prove the, that the formula, if we pass to non-inertial coordinates, then we are uh, must to add such a second order uh, term depending on gamma, which vanishes in an inertial system, which means that indeed in an inertial system it is. Okay, so if the curvature tensor is not zero, then space-time is non-flat. By the way, it is easy to prove that the, if the curvature is totally zero within a certain neighborhood, then we are able to uh, kill gamma, which simply means that the space-time is uh, flat in this, in this uh, region. Okay, now, <clears throat> what are the symmetries? So this is a, I have a tendency to call this object the, the curvature tensor. So first of all, it is a priori symmetric in first two uh, indices, and the total symmetric part is vanishes because this is what we have subtracted. Now, you have studied probably the object which is called Riemann tensor, which has also uh, four indices, but it is anti-symmetric in the last two indices, and moreover, the totally anti-symmetric part is equal zero. Now, a very easy lemma. Those two objects are totally equivalent. If I know Riemann tensor, I will take the symmetric part in first two, multiplied by this coefficient, and this is my 
curvature tensor. Vice versa, if I know my curvature tensor and I uh, perform the anti-symmetrization, this is the Riemann tensor. Okay. And I believe that what I told you is a total discussion of uh, what is the gravitational field. And that at the moment, no metric tensor was used because gravity appears <coughs> either in active way or in passive way. In active way, we, this means how the gravity acts on the motion of bodies. For that purpose, I do not need metric. But of course, this is only half, half of a theory. This is like presenting electrodynamics without Maxwell equations. I, so I have explained you what is a gravitational field, but I didn't even <coughs> mention uh, metric. Therefore, one could say if this is a nice physical field, we would like to know its uh, dynamics. At the moment, the only way to invent intelligent dynamics is to use some variational principle. Therefore, the first, if you have another idea, please tell me, I don't. So my idea would be, suppose I am, I have uh, understood these things in 19, say, 12, and, but I don't know what are those Maxwell equations, those equations which, go, which govern the uh, evolution of this field. So I would say, <laughs> let me try to find the, uh, the Lagrangian. This Lagrangian should depend upon, upon gravitational field and its derivative. But of course, I am looking for such a uh, variational principle which is uh, coordinate invariant, because if I choose some stupid uh, combination of derivatives, the, the evolution will depend upon uh, the uh, coordinate system. Therefore, I should use only geometric objects which are available. Okay, the only available geometric object is this curvature. If you prefer instead to work with um, Riemann tensor, it is equally good because, as you see, it is... Okay. So I am looking for a Lagrangian which depends upon gamma. This is not an easy task because we don't have any metri metric tensor. It is not easy to manufacture a Lagrangian, which must be a scalar density, out of such a thing. Now, um, a theorem which I have written in terms of my k, but of course I, I can uh, equally uh, write down the Riemann version of this, of this R. So, the curvature tensor, or Riemann tensor, if you wish, splits into three different independent irreducible objects. First of all, we may calculate the Ricci tensor, the Ricci tensor, and now this Ricci tensor a priori has a symmetric and an anti-symmetric part. Those of you who remember that Ricci tensor is symmetric, uh, for those of you, I have the following limit. Yes, indeed, it is always symmetric where the, if uh, gamma is metric, comes from metric. Otherwise, it is not. A priori, we have no metric, therefore the Ricci has the symmetric and the anti-symmetric part. So, uh, if I subtract the trace, then Okay, one can say that the entire curvature is, uh, splits into something 
which depends upon symmetric part of Ricci, something which depends upon uh, anti-symmetric part of Ricci, is a, and the remaining part, which is uh, traceless, which may be called vile tensor, although it is not a, properly speaking vile because it is it becomes vile vile only for metric uh, uh, gammas. Okay, so uh, suppose that the god who tries to invent how which uh, equation of gravitational field, uh, field will I uh, decide? <laughs> so the first uh, approach is the following. Take into account only one far, uh, part of them. The my uh, claim is that gravitation is this sector of the entire theory. Uh, if I have enough time, I will maybe uh, say a few words about this sector, and this sector is something which is unknown for me, and maybe this sector, which is a very natural thing, maybe this sector corresponds to what we are looking for, namely this dark matter or something like that. But let us perform a, um, such a game that suppose, forget about these two sectors, and suppose that God has decided that the, he will take into account only the symmetric part that the Lagrangian does not depend upon the whole curvature, but only about the one of those three sectors. Now, he has no choice, because the only, the only way to manufacture a, a scalar density out of a symmetric tensor is this way. However, uh, a um, coefficient is necessary because this physically the miana to jak się powie the, the dimension dimension of the Lagrangian we know what is dimension of the Lagrangian and we know what is dimension of that are, do not agree, therefore a uh, uh, coefficient is necessary here. So the only uh, um, thing which remains to God, who has uh, decided this way, is only the value of this coefficient. Let us treat it and no other way. There are no other Lagrangians. Therefore, let us uh, treat seri seriously this uh, conjecture and try to calculate uh, the field equations. Okay, <coughs> derivatives of gamma enter into uh, this curvature in a linear way, whereas uh, gammas enter into curvature in a quadratic way. Therefore, symbolic... Okay, so it is useful to introduce this shorthand notation, namely derivative of the Lagrangian with respect to K, and this is what? First of all, um, contravariant, because K is covariant, and it is, it is not a tensor, but a tensor density, because lambda was density. <coughs> so the Euler-Lagrange equations are of that type, the derivatives of this quantity, and on the other hand is this quantity, pi, times gamma. It is a matter of a very simple calculation to see that what we get on the on a right hand side is precisely what we uh, need to upgrade this partial derivative to 
the covariant derivative. Therefore, this is precisely Euler-Lagrange equation, which uh, derived from, uh, from this. Okay, so now I propose to give the following physical interpretation to this quantity. This quantity I propose to interpret as a second uh, representation of the metric tensor. First of all, not covariant, but contravariant. Moreover, not uh, tensor, but tensor density. This representation was used already by Vladimir Alexandrovich Fogg in his excellent book written in 1938. He proved that using not just the standard metric, but this representation of metric, a lot of calculations are much, much simpler. Now, my modest contribution to the history of physics is that I propose also to, to, to integrate this coefficient which may be called, uh, which may be called a gravitational constant because the calculation will be even more, e even simpler. And, and now, of course, this equation means nothing but the fact that gamma is metric, which means which otherwise in a conventional formulation of general relativity, which assumed a priori. Now I will really come to the end. Uh, so the, uh, but where are uh, Einstein equations? Einstein equations are written here, namely in the definition of the momenta, because this is a, a relation between uh, curvature and the metric. And I will fast skip the calculations because they are really simple. It turns out that the equations are of that order, uh, of that time, which means that this w 1 over 4 pi and this coefficient is equal to the cosmological constant. Of course, uh, you may feel some unease because we uh, know that lambda equals zero is a nice approximation of uh, because in the small scale we do not see very much cosmological constant and lambda equals zero corresponds to c equal uh, going to infinity but all this can be done correctly all this limit and I am afraid that I have to stop here. So I have maybe convinced you that if we c uh, treat um, gravity as a field of inertial frame, then the theory naturally has three different um, sectors. And maybe I have convinced you that the first sector, namely the one which is uh, corresponds to the symmetric part of Ricci, is gravity. And this is an equivalent sector. Everything works. I will, if somebody will decide to, uh, to give me another possibility, I will discuss the uh, second term and I claim that the second term, namely this one, is electrodynamics, but not just the trivial Maxwell electrodynamics, but it is rather uh, um, uh, Born-Infeld electrodynamics. By the way, the, this idea was already due to Weil. Weil already in the 20s proposed the theory of uh, the description of uh, electrodynamics in terms of this precisely object. However, he thought that uh, F itself is an, uh, is an electromagnetic field. This is not. It is proportional and so on and some uh, vile theory doesn't work. It, it was abandoned. But the idea by vile was, I think, very very nice and it may be realized in a nice way. I stop here because I have already
Thank you very much. Uh, still, we have. Let's thank the speaker, and uh, still you have a room for some comments or questions. Yes. I have a question concerning the dimensions. If you want just to bring moment, in. Just a moment. We have a question from the audience. Yeah. And I will just uh, give you a point. Huh. Go on. I mean, the second term and third term actually cannot be actually written in terms of metric. Pardon me? The yeah. second term, second actually, you said uh, electrodynamics, uh, electro, uh, like, electrodynamic uh, term and uh, wild term cannot be written in, in terms of metric. In which metric? Like uh, G menu. Yeah, yeah, G menu, G menu, I, I have showed you G menu, the metric, appears as a momentum canonically conjugate to the, to gamma, which means the derivative of the uh, Lagrangian with respect to uh, derivatives of gamma. This is just the, the metric. I gave you the de definition of the metric. This. This theory does not contain metric on the level of the Lagrangian, but it, uh, oh, this is the definition of the metric. Whenever you choose Lagrangian, its derivative with respect to uh, symmetric part of the Ricci tensor is the metric. This is the definition of the metric within the theory. No, it is a skew symmetric. Is it skew symmetric? F. But it doesn't have a symmetry. That was the question. Right. Okay, so excuse me. I didn't Thank you very much. Now the question from online audience, please. I have a question concerning dimensionalities. When you split this object into three parts, then if you want to bring it electromagnetic, Field, you need another unit which is independent on the gravitational constant. You another, another what we need? I didn't understand the that. unit that governs electromagnetism, because electromagnetism brings in a special unit with it. Yes, but I have a formulation where the, uh, all the units are correct. Of course, if you want to uh, interpret uh, this uh, object as an uh, electro, uh, electromagnetic tensor, it is wrong. The units do not okay. agree. Um, okay, let let okay. me just uh, very uh, fast. Uh, oh, electrodynamics. Uh, electrodynamical uh, uh, tensor is proportional and this proportionality uh, coefficient is uh, equal to one over square root of the uh, cosmological constant. Cosmological constant is very, very big. Therefore, no, sorry, it's very small, but this inverse is very, very big, which means that macroscopic uh, electromagnetic, and the, the, the units agree, the units here agree. And now, uh, this anti-symmetric part of Ricci, of Ricci which, we, which is practically zero, we do not feel it. It is very, very small. However, divided by something which is equal, also extremely small, it gives us something which is macroscopic. Well, I still have a problem because you do need some electromagnetic unit, like, ep, for example, the epsilon, which comes with in the standard definition of the Lagrangian. And you have to relate somehow this may be an interesting exercise, this lambda to the unit of electromagnetism, which you must bring in here. Excuse me, maybe I, I, I didn't understand your question, but if we choose as a Lagrangian the determinant of 
of the total Ricci, which contains the symmetric and anti-symmetric part, then, in, and if you assume that in the zero approximation f is very small, then this Lagrangian is equal to that. And this is, everything agrees. So, well, I in a first approximation, it is just gravitational Lagrangian with cosmological constant plus a standard electromagnetic Lagrangian. However, this is only the, uh, the, the uh, first, because uh, in a better approximation, in a better approximation, uh, this is a kind of a Infeld, born Infeld. Yes, yeah. but in the born it, it is just a born born infeld uh, Lagrangian, where uh, again the born infeld constant is again provided by the cosmological constant. But cosmological constant has a different dimension than the born yes. infeld coefficient. Where do you yes. get the, the and this where agrees. This comes? agrees. Disagrees. Of course, there are many conventions. I love conven the following conventions. That's... Coordinates are uh, dimensionless. Metric is uh, meter square, and this agrees. Okay, let's <clears throat> let's uh, postpone this resolving of this problem to a further discussion. Mm -hmm. Are there any new questions or comments? Yes, Mikoy, please. Pardon? Charges. Whether there are charges electro in this electrodynamics. So? Whether this electrodynamics yeah. uh, describe charges. No, at the moment does not describe, of course, because it is a pure. But if you, I claim that if you take the third sector, that the, the charges will be provided by the last sector. Of course, here, I exclude it is first it was the theory of the pure gravity now it is only gravity and electromagnetism but of course it is not not enough yes so here you considered like these symmetric connections so you didn't allow torsion in your connection yeah. what what would be the physical meaning if you allow uh, yeah. torsion <laughs> Oh, this is a very, uh, people very often ask me this question. The answer is the following. Non-symmetric connection is not an irreducible object. It splits into two different things. Therefore, the theory of a uh, non-symmetric connection, it is like a theory of pairs, a locomotive and an apple. So I prefer to first to describe locomotives and then apples. Therefore, non-symmetric connection splits into a symmetric connection and a tensor field, which is called torsion. So I do not exclude that there are some extra tensor fields, but I will rather treat them as, uh, as uh, matter fields. So, you may perfectly uh, generalize this approach to non-symmetric connection. Uh, and, uh, yes. Uh, electromagnetism can also be um, derived from kaluza klein model. Of course. And so what, what I have feeling that you need just tensor structure and then you can derive everything which has different tensor structure and then you can say this is electromagnetism this is this is it. because it, no. it's just <coughs> tensor so now there should be connection between one theory and another theory in your theory if you continue you you will have all the combination of tensors but there are also in other examples mm -hmm. that's what i want question is yeah. uh, which one gives you electromagnetism and 
No, no, but all of them must agree in, in, uh, if we want to describe what happens in the laboratories uh, in this institute. And of course it agrees, because in the first approximation uh, this theory does not uh, differ from the standard, from the standard electromagnetism. So. So no, no problem, but, uh, but, but of course, what happens if the fields are very strong? Ha, we don't know experimentally, and I think that this framework is very natural. If you want to describe um, gravity this way, you immediately observe that only one sector of the theory corresponds to gravity and there are two other sectors, then you may uh, ask yourself, okay, maybe they are really relevant, but on the other hand, it is interesting that they... Uh. Any further <coughs> comments? Yes, Julius. <coughs> Uh, uh, my question I know, has two parts, I guess. So first, uh, which uh, tensors survive in vacuum? If there is no matter which uh, of your three parts survive, and then uh, what follows is that uh, which tensors contain uh, gravitational waves, for example? Which tensor? So you, you had uh, three uh, yes. parts. So in, in vacuum, which tensors contain gravitational uh, waves? No, no, I believe, I believe that uh, there are all of them. Uh, uh, but we are living in a um, part of a universe where some objects are strong, some are weak. What we observe, we observe relatively uh, strong uh, first sector. We observe, of course, electrodynamics, and I have a proposal to uh, we electro electromagnetic field, which of course is as strong as, as we see. We uh, do not observe strong uh, part of the Ricci tensor here, but my explanation is that uh, because electromagnetic field is proportional only and because the gravitational uh, the uh, this constant lambda is very small then it is it is something like uh, but i am afraid to, to but for instance take uh, hydrodynamics in hydrodynamics uh, density and um, um, pressure are somehow proportional. The uh, the hook uh, or so uh, um, coefficient gives you proportionality between change of uh, density and the uh, pressure. Yeah. Now suppose that what is um, incompressible fluid. Incompressible fluid is that this uh, proportionality coefficient is extremely big. Therefore, we say those changes of the uh, of uh, the density we almost do not observe. Of course, we know that there are, but it is much easier mathematically to say no, no, rho is always constant, but p now it is no, no longer proportional to delta rho because this proportion and it becomes an extra uh, object so it is something like that that the uh, electromagnetic field is something like pressure and for very uh, for in general situations I say it is somehow proportional to different things, but we do not observe for us the uh, geometry is also incompressible as far as the Ricci uh, symmetry, non-symmetric non part, skew-symmetric part of Ricci is concerned. We, it is almost zero. What we observe is zero. 
but electromagnetic field is not zero. <laughs> Why? Because the proportionality coefficient, this hook coefficient, is extremely good, namely uh, extremely big. It is namely the uh, inverse of the square root of uh, of cosmological constant, something like that. Okay. I may allow myself uh, one quick question. Uh, as far as I understand, Mikowai question, it was about a worry that this field of inertial frames, if we include charges, will depend on the charge of particles, uh, that motion we, we observe, right? No, because uh, yeah. actually uh, every, every theory can be described as geometry. But the problem is that this geometry depends now on the ratio of the charge to mass. Mm -hmm. And actually the gravity, the motion in the gravity does not depend because the equality of, of, of inertial and, and, uh, and gravitational masses, right? Mm -hmm. And so th this is a little bit worrying, right? Which, inner, which field of inertial frame, frames describes really no, no, but I have a, I have a tendency, okay, I don't claim that I will answer fully this question, but my uh, tendency is to think that uh, charges are all, also carried by some fields, not those fields, but some extra fields, okay. because mm -hmm. I don't ex exclude that besides this extra second and third sector there are some extra fields and therefore everything okay. is somehow okay okay field. i understand and mm -hmm. now let me comment on something because you may probably know or not that i am teaching physics in undergrad undergraduate mm -hmm. school and of course it is not true that we are that we don't teach students that atoms are, are like solar systems actually officially we still do teach like that yes. although I cannot really force myself to, to tell him that, and I just explained that electron is there around the uh, proton in the uh, hydrogen atom, and that simply what changes is if you want to meet it, just stay close to the proton, not far away from it, mm -hmm. because far away you will wait very long time to, to, to meet electron there. But now there is another problem. How to explain the rise of Newtonian gravity from general relativity framework uh, in a way which can be apprehended by uh, high school uh, students. I remind yourself, you that that's a just a, a, the Newtonian potential is just a correction to G00 metric mm -hmm. tensor. And with all that mechanism and with all that machinery, of course, you can indeed derive using connection and Christopher symbols, you can derive the equ Newtonian equations of, 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 of motion, but how to explain that bodies tends to accelerate when they get closest to masses without gamma mass uh, seems an open problem and, and actually a, a demanding problem that if somebody comes, I don't know whether Pavel Nurovsky follows, probably not, but if somebody comes across an idea how to explain it in a simple way, that would be a great breakthrough in education. Jurek, that's a... Well, I'm not saying Thank that's a question much. now, but that's a... Mikowai, that's also for you, right? Uh, okay, if there are no any further questions or comments, let's thank the speaker again. Thank you. Thank you very much and see you next week. Thank you.